Good morning and welcome to another version of virtual worship at the Church of Eastern Oaks. We're so glad that you're already tuning in and you're ready to worship with us. Psalm chapter 95 says, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. We're coming this morning to worship. We're not coming to just view. We're not coming just to watch. We're here to worship the Lord. There are a few announcements that you need to be aware of. I just want to remind you that, again, next Sunday we'll do, <clears throat> just like we're doing this morning, next Sunday you'll have an opportunity to either come and worship with us in a drive-in service. We'd love for you to be able to do that if you possibly can. Or you can watch on YouTube or Facebook. So just like you're doing today, you can watch on YouTube or Facebook, or you can come and worship with us in drive-in service. On Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays at 6.30, uh, the pastors do pastors in quarantine, quarantine with the pastors. Uh, and we'd like for you to be a part of that uh, this past Wednesday night. We picked out our favorite book of the New Testament. This next week, we're going to out, pick out our favorite book of the Old Testament, and we'll share why it's our favorite book. And we do that on the Wednesday night Bible study, so we want you uh, to be a part of that. God's still doing exciting things in the life of the church, and we don't want you to miss any of those things. So be sure you worship with us on Sunday morning in one of the forms that we make available. Be with us on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays and watch Quarantine with the Pastors. One of the things we want to do at the beginning of the service this morning is we want to have our praise time and prayer requests. Praise time is this. You're watching. All you need to do is just type in some praise reports right now. God is doing something in your life. Type in those praise reports and let some of the other church family and other people even that are not a part of the Eastern Oaks Church family, let them see what God is doing in your life. So type in those praise reports, prayer requests, go to the, ch to the church at Eastern Oaks app, fill out a prayer request, send it in, and Pastor Danny will make sure that it goes out tomorrow when we send prayer requests. Let's begin with prayer this morning. Father, we thank you today that again this week, even though we're having to do virtual service, we're still able to worship you. And we thank you, Father, that even though we're separated physically, we're not separated from you. And God, we come into your house today to worship you and to praise you. And your house, Father, it's not just a building that's located on Wares Ferry Road, but your house is wherever Christians are assembled. And so I pray, Father, today that each one that is being a part of this worship service, that this will truly be a time that they lift up their hearts and praise you in music and that they listen attentively to Pastor Dan as he brings the message. Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Deborah. worshiping with us this morning. We're going to start our worship service, our uh, music part of our service today with a little chorus called Beautiful One. The beautiful one that we love and adore is Jesus. Amen. Let's sing this together this morning as we fellowship.
we're going to sing a couple of hymns together. The first one, Oh, How I Love Jesus. Yonder, I'll be there. This is the time of the service when we receive God's tithe of our offering. And I want to remind you there are several ways that you can continue to worship the Lord with his tithe and your offering. And one is you can mail them in. And some people are doing that. You can just simply write a check, drop it in an envelope, and mail it in. The other is that you can go on the church app. And you can give to the church app. The other one is that you can give <coughs> through uh, online giving. So you can give an app, you can give online, you can mail it in. If next Sunday you come to the drive-in service, the box will be open, the mailbox will be open as you turn in. All you got to do is just put a, don't just put a check in there, but put a check in an envelope and put it in the mailbox. And David is here for drive-in service. He'll pick it whenever he's pick it up, whenever he starts to leave. So thank you for continuing to worship and serving the Lord and your giving of tithes and offering. Let's continue to do that as God continues to bless us. Father, we pray today that as we set aside that portion which you've blessed us with and we give that tithe and offering, Father, we thank you so much for blessing us. I pray, Father, for those that are in need, and there are, Father, those that are struggling financially. God, I pray that you'll minister to them. Father, I pray that you'll touch them and touch their finances. Help them to be wise in the way that they spend. Father, help them to be faithful in their giving to you as seed faith, Father. 
Father, I pray that we'll be faithful in our giving of the tithe and offering. In Jesus' name, amen. Deborah? to worship with us this morning and we're going to sing a few choruses together this morning this first one we're going to sing about is the cornerstone and i have a question that i want to ask you is jesus the cornerstone of your life today if he's not then all of your life will crumble if your foundation is not built upon jesus christ the cornerstone then it will not it will not last so let's sing this chorus together this morning. This says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Thank you. 
on the cross of Calvary so that we could have forgiveness of our sins. I thank you for that today. I thank you for your grace and your mercy. Lord, I thank you for coming to this earth and living a perfect, sinless life and then dying on that tree for me. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We praise you. We worship you and we adore you today. Good morning. As we begin this morning, I want to tell you a little story, a very true story. See, a little while ago, uh, my wife and I were actually invited to the birthday party of a very close friend of ours. And so we left the children with the grandparents and we went to attend this birthday party. Now, I have two kids, okay, a 10-year-old and a 7-year-old. And so I've been to a lot of children's birthday parties, okay? If you're a parent, you know this. You get invited to a lot of kids' birthday parties. So I've been to a lot, more than I care to attend. I've been to a lot of kids' birthday parties. And so I know when you attend a child's birthday party, that child expects gifts. I mean, that's the fun of having a birthday party when you're a kid, is having all these people bring you gifts. And so I know that when I attend a child's birthday party, gifts are expected. However, this was an adult's birthday gathering, a birthday party, and so I had the impression that this was more of a kind of an inform, informal affair. 
uh, you know, just kind of a cookout, barbecue type thing. We were just going to be hanging out and, and spending some time together, maybe eating a little cake. And uh, as we prepared to leave for this birthday party, I even thought to myself, you know, should we bring a gift? But I didn't think that this was that type of party, and I didn't want to show up and be the only one there that had brought a gift. I thought that would kind of be awkward, and so we decided not to bring any gift. Now, maybe that's just because I'm cheap. I have been accused of that in the past, so that wouldn't be new, but that's not the point of this story. Um, So we show up at this birthday party with no gift, and everybody else there has a gift. So again, I didn't bring a gift because I didn't want to be the only one bringing a gift. Now I'm there with no gift, and I'm the only one there with no gift, and I think this is a much worse scenario, but what are you going to do? But I thought to myself, you know what, I think I'm okay. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to hang out for a little while. We're going to eat. We're going to visit. We're going to talk. You know, these type of outdoors and outside thing, we're cooking out. People are mingling around. And then as the party kind of gets later in the night, we'll just sneak right on away. We'll go home, and no one will ever know that we're the cheapskates that didn't bring a gift. Unfortunately, this was not my night. At this particular party, they decided to have this grown individual open his gifts right there in front of everyone, you know, like we're at a Chuck E. Cheese birthday party for a six-year-old. So there we sit, all gathered together around, and this individual is opening his birthday gifts, and he opens one particular gift. In fact, it actually is the same thing that I was thinking about bringing as a gift, but didn't. And so this individual opens this birthday gift, and immediately he assumes it's from me. And so he opens this gift, and he looks at me, and he's like, oh, this must be from you. And he starts thanking me for this gift and going on about what a thoughtful gift it is and what a great gift it is and how difficult it must be to find. And, of course, while he's looking at me, now everybody's looking at me as he's telling me, thank you for this wonderful gift. Now, I'll be honest with you. I'm not proud about this, but for just the briefest moment it did cross my mind, just smile and say you're welcome. (laughs) Just let it go. Look, he thinks it's from you. He's excited about it. Just smile and say you're welcome. However, the moment that goes through my mind, I'm also reminded that, you know what, whoever actually did bring that gift is probably there somewhere, and they're wondering why I'm not saying anything. And, you know, there's also that thing in the Bible about, you know, honesty and lying being bad. So all of that, you know, combined led me to finally speak up there and say, no, 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 it's not from me. I didn't bring that gift. In fact, I didn't bring any gift, but I didn't say that. But I didn't bring that gift. Um, And so somebody, whoever actually brought the gift, speaks up, and and we move on. Odd moment, right? Um, The question I want to ask is this. Why would I do that? Now, not why would I show up at the party with no gift. I'm a cheapskate. We've already established that. But why would I be tempted to say the gift was from me? Why would the thought even cross my mind to take credit for that gift? Well, folks, the answer is quite simple. I liked the idea of getting all the credit. You see, by human nature, we like to get the credit. We like to be honored. We like to be elevated. We like to feel important. Humility is not a characteristic that comes naturally to human beings. It is something we often struggle with. We like to be honored. We like to be elevated. This morning, we're returning to our study of Luke, and we're in Luke chapter 3. We are continuing to look at the life of John the Baptist. And you know, John is a great example of the humility that we are to have specifically before our Savior, Jesus Christ. In fact, John's mindset can be summed up in his own words. A very well-known passage of Scripture we find in the Gospel of John. John chapter 3, verse 30, we read John the Baptist saying these words, He must increase, 
but I must decrease. He must increase, but I must decrease. That is the attitude that we want to have. That's the mindset that we want to have. Jesus must increase, but I must decrease. Jesus gets all the credit for everything. I get nothing. Jesus is honored. I am not. Jesus is elevated. I am not. And this is exactly the attitude exemplified here in Luke chapter 3. Let's read a few verses together this morning. We're going to be in Luke chapter 3, reading verses 15 through 17. Let's look there together. Luke chapter 3, starting in verse 15. The Scripture says, As the people were in expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. While John clearly communicates multiple things in this passage, the overarching theme in these verses is the superiority of Jesus. That is the one thing John wants to communicate in these three verses is the superiority of Jesus. In fact, we've seen this several times already in the first few chapters of Luke. Luke has went to great lengths to compare John the Baptist and Jesus in such a way that we clearly see Jesus is superior. And now we see... The same thing coming from the lips of John himself. John wants to be crystal clear. Jesus is the important one. And you know, this is all the more impressive when we remember verse 15 and all the attention that John was getting. Look back with me. If you have your Bibles open there, look back with me to Luke chapter 3, verse 15. The Scripture says, As the people were in expectation... And all were questioning in their hearts concerning John whether he might be the Christ. At this particular time in his ministry, John's popularity was quite high. Everybody knew John. We've already seen in chapter 3 that people from all walks of life are coming out to hear the preaching of John. They're coming out to see John. They're coming out to be baptized by John. They are obviously very impressed with him. In fact, they are so impressed with him that many of them begin to question, is this the guy? Is this the Messiah? Is this the one that we've been waiting for? Knowing human nature as we do, I imagine there had to be at least some level of temptation for John to accept that adoration, for John to accept that praise. And yet what does he do? He immediately points people back to Jesus. He immediately tells them, no, I'm not the guy. No, I'm not the Messiah. No, I'm not the important one. Jesus is. John knows this is not about him. He knows that he's not the Messiah. He is not the one deserving of praise and adoration. He is merely the one preparing the way. His job is not to point people to himself. His job is to point people to Jesus. In this passage this morning, we see multiple ways in which John emphasizes the superiority of of Jesus. I want us to briefly look at a few of these and then I want us to ask the very important question, how does this passage apply to us? You see, the first thing John emphasizes is the superior power of Jesus, the superior might of Jesus. We see this in verse 16. Look there with me once again. 
We're just going to read the first half of that verse. Scripture says, John answered them all saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. Stop right there. He who is mightier than I is coming. You see, the first thing we see, and if you're keeping notes, you want to keep notes with us this morning in your app, I want you to write this down. Jesus is mightier than John. Jesus is mightier than John. Listen, folks, John wants everyone to know he is not the Savior. He is not the Messiah. He cannot save anyone. He does not have that kind of power. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is stronger than John. Jesus is more powerful than John. Jesus is mightier than John. There is no comparison. Jesus is superior. And this hopefully goes without saying, but the same is true for us. The same is true for every other human being that has ever lived or will ever live. Jesus is mightier than all others. You know, there is often a temptation for us to make heroes out of people who are not heroes. We have a tendency of elevating people, of putting people on a pedestal, sometimes ourselves and sometimes others, but we are constantly looking for someone to save us. We are constantly looking for someone to fix things. We are looking for that strong person, that mighty leader especially during difficult times. Right now as a country we are facing very difficult times and the temptation is for us to look for a savior. The temptation is for us to look for a doctor that can fix this or a scientist that can fix this or a politician who's going to make this all better. There is a temptation for us to seek out powerful people, mighty people, and try to fix this situation. But folks, we need to understand something very clearly this morning. There is none mightier than Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. We must constantly keep our eyes focused on Him. We need to be calling out to Him in prayer every single day. We need Jesus more than we need any politician, scientist, or doctor. I'm not saying these people are bad, these people are not bad. I'm not saying we don't need them, we do need them, but we need Jesus more. Just as Jesus was mightier than John, Jesus is mightier than anyone on the face of the earth today or that will ever walk the earth again. We need to look to Him. Second way John emphasizes that Jesus' superiority in verse 16 is regarding His worth. Let's look at this again. Look with me at Luke chapter 3 and verse 16. Luke chapter 3 and verse 16. John answered them all, saying, I baptize you with water, but He who is mightier than I is coming. And then He says this, The strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. John tells us that he is not even worthy to untie the strap of Jesus' sandals. Now this is an amazing picture that John is painting for us here. You see, most people in the first century, they either went completely barefoot, or if they had shoes, they wore some type of sandals and their feet would get extremely dirty. The roads weren't paved. They were dirt roads. Animals traveled those same roads. Their feet would be nasty. They would be filthy. They would smell horrible. They would be disgusting. And touching someone else's feet was considered disgraceful. It was considered humiliating. In fact, New Testament scholar Daryl Balk writes, one duty of a slave was to untie the sandals from his master's feet. But in Judaism, this was such a degrading act that a Hebrew slave was not to undertake it. It was so disgusting, so horrible, that a Hebrew slave would not even be required to touch someone's feet to unstrap their sandals. However, John says, listen, I'm not even worthy to do that. 
John says, compared to Jesus, I'm not even worthy to be his slave. I'm not worthy to be his servant. Here again, we see Jesus' superiority. Write this down with me this morning. Jesus is more worthy than John. Jesus is mightier than John, and Jesus is more worthy than John. Jesus is the one who is worthy of all of our praise and all of our worship. Why? Because He is God. That is not true for John, and it's not true for anyone else. In verse 16... As we continue reading, John also compares his baptism, John's baptism, to the baptism that Jesus will perform. What does John say? John says in the opening of verse 16, he says, Look, I baptize you with water, but he who is coming will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. John's baptism was primarily symbolic. John's baptism is very similar to the baptisms we perform today. John's baptism did not wash away any literal sins from the individual. It was a symbolic act. John's baptism didn't save the individual, just like our baptism doesn't save the individual. However, the baptism that Jesus provides, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire, is superior to John's in every way as it does convey salvation. But only to those who accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are baptized with the Holy Spirit, and that does convey salvation. You are saved. Here again, John shows us the superiority of Jesus. We see that Jesus' baptism is superior to John's. Jesus is mightier than John. Jesus is more worthy than John. And Jesus' baptism is superior to John's. Again, whereas John's baptism was symbolic, Jesus' baptism will divide the world into two groups. The saved and the lost. We've said this many times before. There are only two types of people in the world, saved and lost. Race doesn't matter. Ethnicity doesn't matter. Gender doesn't matter. There is saved and there is lost. And the baptism which Jesus offers the world will convey forgiveness of sins, does convey eternal salvation, but only to those who accept Him as their Savior. Those who do not accept Jesus Christ as their Savior will suffer eternal damnation. We see this separation illustrated perfectly if we keep reading. We come to verse 17. Luke chapter 3, verse 17. John the Baptist goes on to say, His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Listen closely, church. John does not sugarcoat the truth. Hell is real. There will be eternal, lasting punishment for anyone who does not call upon the name of Jesus. Jesus Christ is the only one who can save. Again, we see His superiority in this. This is something that we read about in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Acts chapter 4, verse 12, the book of Acts tells us, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. No one else can save. John the Baptist can't save. Muhammad can't save. Buddha can't save. Superman can't save. There is no politician today that can offer eternal salvation. No doctor, no scientist, no leader of any kind. There is one Savior, Jesus Christ. John's intention in this passage is to demonstrate Jesus' superiority. John wanted to make it very clear He is not the Messiah, and He should not be confused with the Messiah. I think we can all agree He's pretty successful. However, what does any of this have to do with us? We're not John. 
And I hope, I hope that none of us are tempted to think we might be the Messiah. Just in case you think you're the Messiah, let me go ahead and break the news to you. You're not. And just to be safe, if anyone else ever claims to be the Messiah, they're not. So that being the case, how do we apply this passage to ourselves today? What does this passage have to teach us as we strive to follow the Messiah in our daily lives? Well, I think there are at least two big takeaways from this passage for us today, and I want you to remember these. Here's the first one. Write this down. We point people away from ourselves and to Jesus. Our responsibility is to point people away from ourselves and to Jesus. Again, think about John the Baptist. He could have accepted the praise and the adoration of the people, but he didn't. John continued to point people to Jesus every chance he got. The Jewish historian Josephus wrote about how susceptible the people were at this particular time to liars and frauds who would show up on the scene and preach a message of hope and deliverance and they would, they would garner these huge crowds that would follow them. It would be very tempting to take all the credit for that, to enjoy all of the attention. And however, or you, but yet that's not what John does. John continually shifts the attention off of himself and back onto Jesus. John continually says, it's not about me, it's about Jesus. In fact, when Jesus finally shows up, John is the first one to point to him and say, there he is. That's him. That's the guy. It's not me, it's him. There even came a point later when some of John's disciples appear to be a little jealous of Jesus' ministry. Jesus' ministry is beginning, people are starting to follow him, and some of John's disciples, they only really like it because they're a little jealous. And so John has to tell them, Guys, look, I told you. I told you I'm not the guy. I told you I'm not the Messiah. I told you one greater than me was coming. This is, of course, that passage that we spoke of earlier. Let's look at it once again. John chapter 3. Let's start reading in verse 27 this time. John chapter 3, verse 27. This is when John's disciples come to John and say, Hey, look at all these people following Jesus. Here's what John said. Verse 27, John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. And in verse 30, we hear those words, He must increase, but I must decrease. John continually pointed people away from himself and to Jesus. And that's exactly what we must do. We must point people away from ourselves and to Jesus. Whatever platform God has given you, whatever sphere of influence you have, whatever circle of friends you find yourself in, wherever you find yourself employed, that is your mission field. And your responsibility, your mission in every one of those places is to point people away from you and to Jesus. Everyone that knows you needs to know first and foremost more than anything else you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Everyone that knows you needs to hear you praising the name of Jesus. Everyone that knows you needs to hear you giving all credit to Him. The fact of the matter is, I have nothing to offer of any value other than Jesus. If all you ever know is me, you are in serious trouble. The world does not need to know me. And that goes for you as well. The world does not need to know you. 
The world needs to know Jesus. We need to take every chance, every opportunity to point people to Jesus. We need to give Him all the credit for everything in our lives. When I do something great, I want to give Jesus Christ the credit. When I accomplish something, I want to say it's all because of Him. When I mess up, when I do something horrible, I want to talk about the mercy of Jesus and the grace of Jesus because He loves me even though I make mistakes. Everything I do, I want to point, my, point people away from me and back to Jesus. Second application. Again, goes back to the importance of humility. And the application is this. We must never confuse what we do with what Jesus does. Again, if you're keeping notes, write this down this morning. We must never confuse what we do with what Jesus does. John the Baptist was clear that Jesus' ministry was on a completely different level than his. Jesus was the Messiah. John was merely preparing the way. John said, hey, I'm only baptizing with water, but the one that's coming, the Messiah, is going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John understood that what he was doing was not on the same level as what Jesus would do. Now, again, I'm not saying John's ministry was unimportant. It absolutely was important, but it wasn't the same. John didn't save anyone. Jesus did. And the same is true for us today. We often say here, we can't save anyone, only He can. We can't grow the church, only He can. Now, yes, we have talents, we have abilities, we have spiritual gifts that we can use for the kingdom, but we must always remember where did those talents come from, where did those gifts come from, where did those spiritual abilities come from? They came from Him. They came from the Holy Spirit. I can't even take credit for the good things that I do because He enabled me to do them. Scripture tells us He is the potter, we're the clay. The clay doesn't get to take credit for anything. The clay just lays there in a lump. You ever seen a potter molding a pot on a, on a potter's wheel? The clay does nothing. The clay is a lump of kind of ugly mess if you've seen it. And it does nothing. The potter does everything. In the words of John, he must increase, we must decrease. That's our prayer. That's our goal. That's our mission. To increase the name of Jesus. As we dismiss today, let's allow... John the Baptist to remind us of the superiority of Jesus. He is the only divine Son of God. He is the Savior of the world. He is the Messiah. There is no other. As we read in the book of Acts, there is no other name by which men must be saved than the name of Jesus. We cannot do what He did. We cannot save ourselves. We can't save others. And that's okay. Listen, it's okay. He doesn't need us to do what he did because he did it. All he asks us to do is point people to him. And that's what we want to do today. We want to point people to Jesus. We want to stop living life as if it's all about us. We need to stop living life as if I'm the important one and we need to start living life by pointing people to Jesus. We want to point people to Jesus with our words. We want to point people to Jesus with our actions. He must increase. I must decrease. So how do we do that? How do we accomplish that? I don't know. That's something for you to pray about, but here's a couple, couple suggestions. Maybe we use social media more to elevate the name of Jesus than to elevate ourselves. I mean, let's just be honest, folks. The creation of social media was all about one thing. Social media is a, is a platform for me to say, look at me. 
Look what I've done. Look how cute my kids are. Look at the vacation I've went on. Look at the food that I cooked. Social media is all about me. It's all about me saying, look at me. What if we started using it to say, look at Jesus. Look at Him. Look at what He's done. What about our schedules? What do our schedules say about us? Most of the time, our schedules say, my life is about me. My life is about me. It's about my family. It's about my kids. It's about what I want to do. What if we began to make changes to our schedule so that our schedule proclaimed the name of Jesus? So that when people looked at our schedule, they would say, Jesus is the most important thing in their life. It's not their kids. It's not sports. It's not school. It's not work. I can look at their schedule and say, Jesus matters most. He must increase. I must decrease. That is our goal. There are a million ways that we can apply that. I encourage you today to prayerfully ask, Lord Jesus, how can I increase your name? Join me in prayer today. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you, Lord God, lifting up your name, elevating your name. You are what matters. Lord, too often we are tempted to make too much of ourselves. We are tempted to take all the credit. We're tempted to seek out the adoration and the praise. We're tempted to say, look at me. But God, no one needs to look at us. They need to look to your son, Jesus. And so I pray right now, Father, that you wake us up. That you change our hearts and our minds. Lord God, that you give us the attitude that says we must increase the name of Jesus and we must decrease. Lord, we love you. We give you all the praise and glory. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you once again for joining us for this online worship service here at the Church at Eastern Oaks. We hope to see you back soon, live and in person. But until then, we'll see you next time. Have a great day.